Hello everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous et bienvenue. Uh, welcome or welcome back to the online seminar series on programming in mathematics education. I say welcome and welcome back because we have many uh, people who uh, were there last time two weeks ago and were here again today, but we've got also new registrations. So welcome to those who have uh, just joined us. Um, I will shortly introduce myself, Chantal Buteau from Brock University, uh, and I'm delighted to uh, co-host this event with George Gedanadis from Western University, also co-director of the Mathematics Knowledge Network, MKN, and together with Ariel Figo from MKN and Sarah Gannon, a Brock um, University uh, graduate student, and all of us from Canada. Uh, we wish to begin by acknowledging this land where the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences is situated and from where we are hosting this event. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to be hosting our online seminar series from this land. Uh, we launched this seminar series two weeks ago with Celia Hoyles and Richard Nas, and today we will hear a seminar presentation by Krista Francis and Brent Davis. I will not introduce again the whole uh, program of the seminar series, but I would like to draw your attention to a change in the program. Uh, on August 14, uh, we're delighted that Dr. Ricardo Scuculia from Sao Paulo State University in Brazil has accepted to uh, give a seminar talk. Uh, this series is uh, supported in part by funding from the Mathematics Knowledge Network, MKN, hosted by the Field Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, the, the seminar format will be similar as what we've done uh, last time. Uh, the speakers uh, will be presenting for about 45 minutes and will address us all, academics, uh, elementary and high school teachers and leaders, as well as graduate and undergraduate students in mathematics education. After which, we will have a period of questions. Uh, everyone will be invited to ask questions. Participants, you may ask the question using the chat and we could uh, ask the question directly or uh, you could also raise your hand, use the uh, icon and we will unlock your microphone for you to ask your questions. And at the end, we'll just take a few minutes to make some final announcements. I think on this, we're ready now to start uh, today's seminar. So I will invite uh, Sarah to now introduce the speaker for today's seminar. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you today's speakers, Dr. Krista Francis and Dr. Brent Davis. Dr. Krista Francis is an associate professor at the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Her research focuses on STEM knowledge for teaching and teachers' professional learning, technology integration for learning, and designing learning environments for teachers and students. Her current research is part of a SHRC Insight Development Grant titled The Intersection of Math, Spatial Reasoning, and Robotics Programming, an emergent multifaceted study on how children learn through STEM education. She's the director of the Imperial Oil Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Education Initiative and has held positions as the Academic Program Coordinator for the Masters of Education in Design-Based Learning and the Undergraduate Course Coordinator for STEM Education at the University of Calgary. Dr. Brent Davis is a professor at the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. His research focuses on teachers' disciplinary knowledge of mathematics and the structures and experiences that support teachers' mathematical learning. His current projects include Transforming Mathematical Identities, 
the potential for collective learning to create free spaces for mathematics and using emergent technologies to develop mathematical objects and actions to think with, both funded by SHRC. She's held positions as the Canada Research Chair in Mathematics Education and the Ecology of Learning, the David Robitaille Chair in Mathematics Education, and the Distinguished Research Chair in Mathematics Education. Together with Dr. Sharon Friesen, Drs. Francis and Davis are the co-authors of STEM Education by Design, Opening Horizons with Possibility. So with that, I warmly welcome Krista Francis and Brent Davis for their presentation, Computational Thinking and Experiences of Arithmetic Content. Thank you very much, Shannon, for that nice introduction. I would like to take the opportunity to thank George and Chantel both for inviting us to speak today and for this series, especially during this time of COVID. Like we're all, you know, this is our conference season and we're not getting our opportunities to go to conferences. So thank you very much for bringing learning right into our own homes and offices, which is great. So I'm Krista. He's Brent. Wave Brent. And uh, we interrupt each other a lot, so don't be offended. No, we don't. <laughs> okay, so um, for those of you who were there two weeks ago, we just want to take a moment to tie into um, Celia and Richard's presentation um, and find some commonalities um, like them. You know, we also draw on Papert and Constructionism. Um, they describe their overlaps between computational thinking as such and uh, you'll find that we actually blur these boundaries a little bit more and uh, we also totally agree that uh, good design is essential for all learners so just to give you a little overview so you know what we're doing first we're going to situalize ourselves conceptually first we're going to visit um, our website learningdiscourses.com it's a project that brent and i've been working on for a couple of years and situate ourselves there then we're going to brush past conceptual metaphor theory and dig into the concept of number. We're going to introduce the robot set, or research setting, robot setting, kind of works. Um, <laughs> and uh, our focus is on um, programming motion with robotics. And we've designed tasks to complement mathematics learning. And then we're going to, the bulk of our presentation is actually some analyzed video data. There's my, nine minutes of data, but it's been parsed into four four pieces and we'll show those with some interpretation and then we're going to end with some uh, culminating assertions and conjectures over to you brent um yeah as, as krista mentioned um learningdiscourses.com discourses on learning and education is a project that we've been working on for a couple of years um the the current site has about 800 discourses um summarized interpreted uh connected differentiated and over the next week krista is going to be adding another 100 or or so discourses or sub discourses holidays yeah. next week <laughs> holidays yeah um so i don't want to say too much about this map because as you can we put up this image on purpose because it's it's a blur uh, but there, one of the big things that we found as we scanned these eight or nine hundred discourses and continue to scan others is that um, within the field of education, things that call themselves theories of learning largely aren't. So, click, please, Krista. Um, it is roughly half, and it's interesting that it divided so evenly, of the discourses that say they are discourses on learning are actually applications of principles of learning, which is to say they're discourses of teaching. Click. Um, so the way this map is organized is that upper region where the, the orange label is, uh, has we've clustered the discourses on teaching, and the lower um, region is where we uh, clustered the discourses on learning and these are discourses that try to figure out what learning is about its mechanisms its dynamics its complexities uh, a click in terms of the discourses that I uh, mentioned at the start um, this is where we land Papert's constructionism that is up in the teaching region it is about applications of principles on learning and another click this is where we land the discourses that we work uh, with in this project and the idea is to inform the teaching and that's why we invoke constructionism and other things but uh, for the most part we um, orient ourselves through 
uh, discourses that are strongly associated with the cognitive sciences. And today, in particular, we'll, we'll be drawing on conceptual metaphor theory and, and conceptual blending theory. Okay. So uh, just some orienting remarks uh, before that, and we'll try to get to the video as quickly as we can. Um, conceptual metaphor theory, um, as I just mentioned, is a sub-discourse of the cognitive sciences. Um, and it's also associated, it's strongly associated with embodied cognition discourses. And um, if you want to see the links that we draw between them, you can visit the site and see how we, how we do that. But I won't talk about that much now, but I will point to three key tenets of conceptual metaphor theory that matter for what we're doing. First is that human thought is mainly analogical, not logical. That is, we are association making creatures. Uh, we operate by metaphor, metonym, and analogy much more than we do by logic. Um, and that is the second point. The metaphor is actually one of the key mechanisms um, in human thinking, and um, many cognitive sciences see it as the um, essential element of human thinking. <clears throat> One of the reasons for that, and this is the connection to embodied cognition, is that metaphor is seen as a means to bridge bodily experience to conceptual interpretation, and we'll offer a, 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 some illustrations of that particular remark presently. Um, Laycock and Nunez in 2000 um, explored some, did a preliminary exploration of some of the uh, key issues with, or key locations of uh, metaphor in thinking about mathematics and ventured a little bit toward mathematics to teaching and learning, but didn't go very far. So we're going to pick up on what they did and offer uh, some elaborations that we think are relevant. Their work is uh, developed around foregrounding metaphors of arithmetic. So we're, we're going to identify the metaphors and give, uh, explain them through an illustration. The first of these is object collection. So if you were talking about the number five in object collection, you might represent it in this way, as five discrete items. That is, in this instantiation, number is a count. Their second instantiation is, or metaphor, is object construction. And in this case, uh, number is a size. That is, if you were to represent five, it would be the fifth one down there, and it's five by virtue of its size. Now, these two might... Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> no, that looked on purpose. Um, the, this is one of the, the places where we experience a lot of difficulties in working with teachers to uh, clearly these, these two uh, representations are different. Five discrete objects versus one uh, five-sized object. Those would be encountered differently by a novice learner, but it turns out that expert learners often have a really difficult time seeing the difference. Third one, please, Krista. Uh, measuring stick, again, we expert learners look at this and say all three of those fives are the same, but they aren't really because this five is a linear distance. It's a one dimensional form. Uh, metaphor four, and moving along a path in, in this instantiation, it looks a lot like the last one, but it's quite different because in this instantiation, number is a point in space. It's a location. Hint. So, don't. I, I stop. Stop doing that, please, and go back up. I'm. So, nothing's changing on my screen, so I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I. Uh, I'll, I'll say click. Okay. Okay. Um. So I, I should mention, Krista and I were planning to be in the same room to do this together, but she did not want to be um, in range of my. I'm not well. I'm not on a ventilator yet, so I'm not that not well. Um, anyway, in our work with teachers, one of the things, uh, it, trying to lay metaphor in front of them hardly works, works at all. 
and they have a really hard time for the most part differentiating and maintaining those, those differences. So one strategy that we found into that is to pose the question, what's being asked here? So click. I'm clicking and nothing's happening. That's what I'm worried about. Okay, click again, please. All right. I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to start it again. It's there. Okay. Okay. Um, so looking across these four metaphors, when your classroom resource asks the question, how many, how many balls are left? How many girls are there? It's a, it's a count question. When it asks how big, how large, how small, it's a size question. So when we say that five is bigger than three, this is the metaphor being invoked. If it asks for how long, and that can be a distance, but it can be a whole lot of other things like how long does it take you to bake a cake? Um, this length metaphor underpins a lot of mathematical constructs. And location, the typical question is where, and there are some uh, variations. The big thing for today's presentation is that we see all of these metaphors present in, in activities around coding motion. Always already they're there, and that's kind of the gist of what we have to talk about. That's where that pregnant pause is. <laughs> well, I'm trying. I found that I'm not that up. I'm no. having troubles with the click. I think it's because of the internet, but all right. Yeah. So let, let me insert that Krista and I just love one another. We really do. So. <laughs> we do. Um, so, um, like we said earlier, we're, we're drawing on constructionism and Papert, and particularly his notion of objects to think with which um, we see as a familiar, or he sees as a familiar construct used to grapple with novel situation. Um, Papert himself uh, used gears as his object to think with. He, he loved playing with gears as a child and loved the circular motion. Later, he used gears as a model for multiplication and relationships between X and Y and systems, thinking about systems and more. So in our experience of working with teachers and students, we noticed that Coding movement requires a facility with the number line. And this made us want to design, might us want to design tasks that um, render the number line to be present for learners. Rendering the number line as an object to think with involves helping people to integrate all these instantiations and numbers. And we can't just lay it in front of learners and expect it to be a useful tool of interpretation for them. That requires carefully structured support. So next, I'm going to start talking about the project and how we can teach concepts of number through the number line in a much more deliberate way. But before we do that, I will uh, give a stronger sense of uh, what we think we're dealing with here. And we're, we're calling it a hypothesertion because we couldn't figure out which of those words is the more appropriate one. Um, the first point of that, of our hypothesertion is that um, coding and computa computational thinking uh, environments for the reasons just mentioned are really good spaces to develop number and arithmetic. And it's again, because pretty much all the instantiations for number that we can think of are present. And then, um, and we need to toss this in. Um, that perhaps should not be at all surprising given the history of coding computational thinking programming. They are the offspring of mathematics. So it shouldn't be surprising that an advanced offspring would have the, um, the traces of its, its uh, originating concepts. So I'll give you a little background about the context. We worked in a school that specializes in students that have diverse learning needs. So we were working with students that have been identified as having some issues with learning. And particularly math learning is, is a very common issue for most of them. And we saw this as an advantage because if there's an issue with the task, it's going to show up. And in the school, they taught weekly robotics classes all year long in place of one of their mathematics classes from the end of September to the end of May. And we're going to show you some video that was taken at the beginning of grade four 
and um, the students hadn't encountered decimal numbers yet, which you'll see is really important in the video. And the students are, as I said, just at the start, they're just learning how to move their robot in a straight line. So the task that they were working on was how many wheel rotations are needed to travel um, 100 centimeters. And we have nine minutes, as I said, a video that's broken up into four parts of two students and their teacher working. And so each of the pair of students had a programmable robot, a meter stick, and an iPad, which was the technology that the school had available. And we just found that the immediacy and portability of the iPad really invited more experimentation and play than when we'd used laptops or desktop computers in the past. Okay, so I'm going to have a little audience participation here, and we're going to ask you to start thinking ahead before you see the videos, which metaphors and number might be more appropriate for this task. So I'm going to get you to go to, I'm going to stop the sharing because I'm going to put this link in the chat. It's already there, but you may want to see it as it just pops up right now and go there and have a, have a vote. And we're going to see, oh, people are already voting, which is fantastic. Well, it's, we got 27 people who voted. Oh, 28. So it looks like count is winning. And then length comes in second with location next. Well, more than half the votes to count. Okay. We'll go back to our slides. Okay. So keep that in mind, most of you chose count. Okay, so moving on to the videos. So this data was chosen from our weekly recordings. We were in grades four, five, and six. This is from grade four. And this video was selected after careful analysis and comparison. Then we transcribed it. We coded it according to the metaphors and number being used. And then this information was compiled inside the video track to show in real time which metaphor was being used and when it was being used. This was quite a time consuming process, but I would be happy to share how I did it with anybody who wants to contact me. So what I want you to do is when you're watching is to watch for the color coded captions and the dot of analysis, the matching colors. And just to get you in the scene, the students start by guessing that it takes 100 wheel rotations to travel 100 centimeters. And the teacher interrupts them and shows them how far the, ro the robot travels with one wheel rotation. So that first blue dot is the count of one wheel rotation. Size of my fingers right now, okay? 
So we want it to go from here to here. How many times do you think that entire needs to go around? 50? I want to go next. Next slide. There we go. Sorry. So you'll notice that in our timestamp, there's six interpretations of number on there instead of the four we discussed earlier. And we're going to explain that in the next slide, or Brent's going to. But just to recap what happened, after their initial guess 100, the students tried 15, then they tried seven, and it was much closer to the distance. And one of the fundamental tenets of cognitive science is that the brain will try to connect things that are experienced at the same time. So we suspect that the students were developing an integrated sense of the relationship between the number of wheel rotations and the distance of one meter. And they're starting to lay the groundwork for consolidating number as count, number as distance, and number of locations traveled. So Brent doesn't like the stat stats, but I do. Oops, I forgot those. Click. See, this is why you were supposed to do it, Brent. <laughs> and uh, you'll see that, like you guys, the teacher started with count. She, she thought count was the um, more appropriate instantiation, but you'll see after about two minutes, she abandoned that and started looking for other instantiations. And uh, just pop back to that one, please, Krista. And that, that's an interesting thing because the question is phrased as a count. It's how many wheel rotations. So um, I just realized that it, it might feel like we kind of duped you into that, but saying how many means count and here's a how many question, were you paying attention? But in fact, it's, it's actually more complicated than that. So as Krista mentioned, the, the, those other two um, uh, instantiations were in there. Um, it turns out that they come up a lot in school mathematics. Um, and we use conceptual metaphor theory, a uh, 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 conceptual blending theory, a complement to conceptual metaphor theory to, to talk about um, what they are and where they come from. And it turns out that another tentative cognitive science, not only do we use metaphor adeptly, we can blend them and mix them and combine them in ways that are just bizarre. Uh, metaphors do not have to be related to be combined by humans. Um, 
who knew? Um, and the interesting thing is that this tends to happen very, very quickly, far faster than um, conscious thought can accommodate. So it's an indication that this really is how brains are structured and how they like to work. Uh, next one, please. So here are the four um, meta uh, metaphors for number based directly on Lakoff and Nunez's grounding metaphors of arithmetic. And here are three others. We see the idea of, of, or, uh, of ordinal numbers um, that give the, the rank of a number um, as a blend. They kind of combine object collection, you need discrete objects, and location. Next one. One of the really, one of the really interesting um, blends um, is number as amount. Now, when you have very, very large numbers, and this representation is an, another five, this would be $5 if we still had pennies. Um, Amounts are discrete, we count them, but it doesn't take long for them to be experienced as continuous. I, I, I'm sure that none of us experience a thousand as a, a thousand discrete things. We, we experience it as, as a whole. And one of the signals in math books about when this is happening is the question, how much? So how much is asks for a large amount. The etymology of amount, by the way, is like pile up. And English has a lot of words uh, in this range, but it is distinct from count. Right? And our third uh, blended instantiation um, is kind of combining all of these. Uh, we're calling it a reification following work from a number of mathematics education uh, researchers, in particular, Anna Safar's work we find um, relevant in this one. But the way this one appears is simply the question, what? What's the missing angle? What's the height of the building? No. That, I shouldn't have said the last one, because clearly the height of the building is a distance. But just, what is three plus two? Okay, next one. So next is the next minute and a half of the video. So we invite you to attend to what's happening at the same time as a strategy for encouraging the blending of metaphors. Yeah, and, and uh, just a further point on that, if you look at the, um, what was it? The point was bigger than that, Krista. What did we talk about yesterday? Oh yeah, and, uh, sorry, she, she did say the right thing. I'm just not quite up to speed here. It, it's this point about the cognitive science ten that two things that happen at the same time, um, or multiple things that happen at the same time are likely going to be blended, even if they shouldn't be blended. So it's sort of watch for the simultaneities in this next little stretch. Let's try it. Let's try it. You guys are so close. Okay. 
Okay, so just quick re quickly recap, the students found that six was even closer, but still a little bit too far. Here are the stats, which I like, but Brent doesn't like. So you can see that seven occurred, seven, the count, the um, location occurred the most often. So she's switching from count into location. And so this is what Brent says. I'm, I'm thinking about it. So you can say it about the disappearance of length. Do you want to say it or you want me to say what you think? All uh, right, you can say it. <laughs> so he thinks that based on the stats with the amplification of location and the disappearance of length, that it looks like length and location are being used interchangeably in this task. Okay, so. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the absence of orange dots in, in this last stretch. Um, I needed Krista to say it because I forgot what it was. Uh, but we think that location is, and, and as, as she just said, that these have been seamlessly blended by the two of them. Sorry, Krista. Okay. Um, what's, what's this slide for? I mean, I'm drawing the distinction between continuous and discrete, which you kind of did in the slide before. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, regarding the uh, instantiations of number, one of the, the, the big ideas in math mathematics that sometimes does not come through that clearly for, for learners is the, the difference between the discrete settings and continuous settings. Um, when you render the, the metaphors explicit, it, it's really obvious um, uh, where the line is drawn. And one of the interesting things about it, again, is that there seems to be at least one transitional metaphor, this I, number as amount that is, again, by definition discrete, but experientially, phenomenologically continuous in very many settings. Um, that's just an interesting thing, and we, we wonder if that might be one of the reasons that um, continuous and discrete um, are sometimes difficult to differentiate. Uh, on to the next one. Okay, so the next video is about three minutes long. This is uh, my favorite in the, in the, of the four. Okay, boy, there it is. Decimal. 
that's a decimal, right? So, what do you want to try? Five decimal one, five decimal two, five decimal three, five decimal four, five decimal five. Five decimal five is right in between five and six. Because I'm halfway. I'm going to try five decimal six. Okay, I like that. Oh no, Gabby, you're me. <laughs> Oh my goodness! We were so close, so close. Okay, what do you think we need to do? So five decimal seven. Yeah. Is that a little bit more? Yeah. A little bit more. Okay. Let's try it. So, Brent, do you want this one? Um, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, just a reminder that this was the student's first encounter with decimal numbers, first uh, formal encounter in, in class. Um, and we were particularly taken by the body language of the students as the, the teacher was suggesting numbers between five and six and uh, related ideas. Um, we recognize this as projection, but we see a little bit of deer in headlights um, as the, uh -huh. like it, it doesn't seem like things are connecting. And um, one of the reasons that they may not be um, is that the teacher, for the most part, is oper operating in the space of reification. She's not anchoring it to a specific interpretation. And when she does dip into the specific interpretation, the lights go on. Well, no, that, that's a bad metaphor to mix with deer and headlights, but you, you, you catch the drift, I'm sure. Next slide. So just oh, to yeah. recap real quickly, in that three minutes, there were 38 instantiations of number. And so we had location as the most count um, amount, almost the same, and uh, quite a bit more of the notion of reification. Um, and a, a final slide uh, based on this chart. Uh, there is some real value in, in being able to parse these metaphors. And one of the big values is appreciating the number systems that they open up. So the object collection metaphor, which is where almost all mathematics pedagogy starts, gives us access to whole numbers, natural numbers, cardinals. The ordinals open up are, are opened up uh, when we understand number as rank. When we understand number as amount, it opens up very large numbers and discrete fractions. When we understand number as size, it opens up uh, common and continuous fractions. When we understand number as length, it opens up the rational numbers, the irrationals, and the integers. One of the big pops come when we understand number as a location because it renders uh, real numbers, imaginary numbers, and complex numbers available. And for the reification, it's kind of all of the above. And that is both blessing and curse for those who have not got a well-consolidated uh, number concept, as we think that la parts of that last uh, stretch illustrated, um, it, can, it can become meaningless very quickly. So the reification is either very meaningful or utterly meaningless. Okay, here's the very last slide. It's only about a minute long, and you can see them honing in on the appropriate metaphor. Fingers crossed, guys. 
So quickly recapping, we see this as really powerful because the very next week, um, the girls were using decimal numbers in another context. And, you know, when we first started working in the school, it didn't matter which grade I was talking to students in grade four, grade five, or grade six, if we asked them what was between two and three, they would adamantly say, there's nothing. And that's despite having learnt decimal numbers. In another school, we were up north in a First Nations school at Whitefish, and um, the children had just learned decimal numbers the week before. But when they were presented with robotics tasks that required coding movement, they couldn't apply their knowledge of decimal numbers into the robots. So it, we're seeing this as really quite powerful. And um, for the task, um, most of the instantiations are location and length. And Brent and I think that's the most important area to hone in as when you're teaching. There were, oh, sorry, Brent, that's you. I guess I missed a slide. Um, uh, yeah, one, one for the comment to the, the, the um, observation of the, uh, kids' use of decimal numbers when they are exposed to them uh, just prior to these sorts of activities in the couple settings that we have encountered that. Uh, we noticed that they tend to use them on as kind of on the, the assumption of discrete quantities. Like even though the, the decimal portion represents a, a part of an object in the uh, count sense, they, it seems to re represent a whole object of some sort. They don't have an image that permits continuity between two numbers. Um, regarding our mode of uh, interpretation and representation, one of the things that um, were uh, ideas we're playing with right now as we uh, analyze multiple videos is that this appearance of strong reification and lots of nodding at the end is a, a, a marker of a task completed of a reasonable understanding of what was being asked and it, it kind of works across all sorts of tasks not just coding movement at the same time it can also be a marker of total bafflement when people surrender to, I'm just not going to be able to make sense of this. Is it 5.7? Um, so it's uh, the uh, number without a reference to location or length or whatever um, is either a blessing or a curse. So like in this nine minutes, there were 91 instantiations of number. The kids had lots of chances to practice. And if you were to look at any textbooks, I'd, I'd be surprised if there were 91 different instantiations of numbers in the whole textbook. So like this is a really, really rich space for, for exploration. Yeah, and, and the same time, at the same time that it's rich, um, it's kind of look at the spray. Um, one of the questions we asked yourself was, how could this have been designed better? A whole lot of what was going on in the communication is, I think this is pretty obvious it, just in listening to the dialogue as it goes along, is kind of guessing at interpretation and hoping that somebody lands on it. So, oh, talking about distance didn't work, let me talk about money, and um, on it goes. So when I work with teachers, I actually use this video to, to, to show how to hone in. And it, it doesn't take long for teachers just to develop that awareness. And then if I'm aware of what instantiations are called for in the task, I, you know, both in my writing and my explanation of it, I, I can call those forward. And, and, and I, we found that the teachers pick up on it very, very, very quickly and are more deliberate in their use of language. And, and we see that the time for understanding things shortens. So I think one final remark on this. The, again, the original question was posed is uh, how many, how many wheel turns does it take to go a meter? Um, look at how quickly and how thoroughly number as count ceased to be useful. So it's really only in the two and a half, first two and a half minutes that it dominated, and then a couple pops a, a little bit later. But uh, the last third of the engagement didn't invoke it at all. Okay, we got to wrap this up. And this is quick. So this is a, a, a restatement of our hypothesertion, except now it's all assertion. Uh, coding is a great place uh, to develop number concepts. 
Are we alternating, Krista? Nope. Nope. No, I thought this was you. Oh, I, my name isn't on it. Um, <laughs> Mine isn't either. <laughs> um, <laughs> the number line in particular. Now, the number line is an invention of mathematics, I and mean, it hadn't been around that long, uh, but it is a stunningly power instantiation. Um, and it supports rapid integration uh, uh, and a translation among the other interpretations. Uh, in that sense, we think it is truly an object to think with if engagements with it are structured well in ways that invite flexible movement across other instantiations. And again, the coding movement is, is just does that. Um, the, this, this last point, uh, click it again, please. Uh, is is related to again to th this uh, representation of the instantiations that we think we encountered. Um, it, we we could say that th this pedagogy was effective. It, we saw the development very quickly over the course of nine nine minutes. Um, new uh, uh, understandings of number and the integration of those new understandings with uh, previous understandings. In that sense, it was effective pedagogy. And at the risk of sounding like I'm one of those people who wants it, it has to be efficient to be effective, I'm not really that way. But I do wonder if, if a bit more care in the design and the preparation might um, have enabled a more powerful um, learning experience. Uh, this one below, we're not going to explain where this ca came from, but it's a very similar exercise. This was about uh, rotating robots from another teacher. It, it took about five minutes. This teacher was more deliberately conscious of the metaphors he was invoking. And we see a less scattershot approach. Um, if you listen to the video, the teacher is actually quite tactical when he thinks, oh, that's not being connected. Let me grab, let me talk about size for a second um, and then move back to length or whatever he was doing. And once again, that marker at the end of um, the conversation just goes to reification. So that's either an indication of understanding or bafflement. And it turns out that we think we can say what it was just by looking at the chart and how things uh, unfolded together. And the other thing that we're finding is that by focusing on the mathematics with the, the coding, they're actually able to apply their coding in more complex situations much more precisely. So it, it's this synergistic um, relationship of both the math, learning mathematics with coding helps the coding. So that's it. We'll open it up to questions. If you want to contact us about anything, those are our contact information. Should I stop the share? What is that? Sure. Thank you, Krista and Brent. A lot of things going through my mind, but we're going to open it up to questions. And one way we can do this is if the people who are attending, oh, first of all, we're going to ask the people, um, sorry, all the panelists. So. Was there anybody in, on the panel be interested in asking a question or making a comment? Richard? Your mic isn't on. That's all right. Okay, okay. okay. I just I have a question which is probably I wasn't paying attention properly or whatever, but I I I wonder how much your analysis is looking at the epistemology of the concept and how much is the pet you, you in your last couple of slides, Brent, you talked about pedagogy a lot. And these two things are clearly related, but they're not the same. Do I have have I missed the point here? Um, have you missed the point? Um, I, I, no, I don't think you have. Um, one of the, the things that we were, uh, we left uh, lying implicit was the, um, was the distinction between the, what is necessary for a number to operate within mathematics and what is necessary um, 
to learn the concept of number. So it turns out, I think Lakoff and Nunez probably have it right that you only need those four metaphors and you can generate pretty much um, all of the sophisticated mathematics. But there are things in elementary school that you can't interpret. Um, and th that presents a need for uh, some blends uh, of new interpretations. So I'm not sure where that sits. Like that seems to be an epistem epistemological question, but it's clearly a ped pedagogical question, right? That there are these things that are not necessary to formal mathematics that are necessary to the learning of mathematics. Right. So uh, that falls in the cracks for me. I, I don't know what to label that as. Okay. I kind of interpreted the question a little differently as like I started with like, you know, how to teach this. Then I went and really looked at what the students were learning. And then I kind of reflected back again. Okay, so seeing what the students are learning, how can I change the task or design the task or subsequent tasks differently for teaching it? So I kind of have this iteration of going back and forth between, yes, like I start started with objects to think with as teaching and drawing on that literature and then the conceptual metaphor theory for understanding what the students are learning. But then I'm going back to, okay, now how can I implement that op objects to think with in a more effective um, manner and help teachers do the same? So that's how I interpreted the question. I don't know who was, you know, it's probably both. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel with a comment or a question? Brent, if I could ask, and Krista, if I could ask a question, did you have a chance to observe students working on these tasks where the teacher was not interfering in any way or involved? And what happened in those cases? <laughs> interfering is such an interesting choice of word. <laughs> um. So most of my videos are just the children and they don't talk a lot. <laughs> so it was really nice to have the teacher prompting conversation. There's a lot of, you know, um, back and forth. So really all you're seeing is the progression of the robot and, and they will put numbers in and they'll trade their iPads back and forth or sometimes they'll hog them or if one has an idea, they'll, they'll, but the conversation is not as rich is, is kind of been my observation if I, but they still get there. They, they yeah. still get there. At the same time, they get the answer. <laughs> We're kind of interested in the space where the teacher is communicating for the reason Krista just gave. Like there's much more discussion, but we're also trying to uh, gather enough information to draw some strong differentiations between being conscious of how you're saying it and when you're saying it and just scattershot approach and let's keep throwing things out there until we find something that works. Like it is clear in the um, instantiations, or in the, uh, we think it's clear, in the incidents when the teacher is more conscious, the pedagogy is simply more effective. So in this um, video that we didn't talk about, um, in this video, the teacher and students are talking for the first two and a half minutes. And then the, it's just the two students and the conversation remained quite rich. So it's one of the few that I have that has rich conversation with just the students. Right, and that's a really good point to throw in. So if you look at about the halfway mark, you can see the students negotiating the different interpretations as they, they move among them. That, that, the chart says sense making is happening here. But if you look before in the first half, you can see a deliberate press toward particular instantiations. And that was the teacher being very conscious about saying, let's frame it in these terms. Yet when the teacher stops talking, the kids stop using his principal instantiation. So. But that's a good point. It's also very difficult, like there's, there is the typing on the keyboard, like my camera, trying to get my camera like in the right wow. place all the time. Is, <laughs> it's, it's very quick when you're working with children. So yeah, I knew I hit the jackpot when I was video taping that one. Again, um, if there's no one else on the panel. So, um, oh, yes. Oh, Silly has one. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just, it's a remark really, it's not a question. Uh, I, I did enjoy your videos a lot, Krista, thank you. 
uh, what struck me was the incredible persistence of these young women, these girls doing this. And I wonder where their motivation to continue so long. I mean, normally uh, kids will want to win a race or something, but they, they just stayed at it for so long. And uh, did you see that often that they continued and they had this persistence and they really well, want to- You can see in the background, there were other kids working without the teacher and they were still working on it. So that's what I see constantly. Like when we were up in Whitefish working on tasks, you know, at, we worked with them three hours a day as we were only there for a week. And the principal and the teacher, they, they were just constantly working. We'd never seen our children engage this hard and, and work for this long. And it was just, the task, I think a well-designed task really helps draw them in. Papert was really onto something. I, mean, I remember there, there was one little boy who, you know, laying under the desk because he was so tired, but, but he still okay. didn't want to go to recess because he hadn't figured it out yet. It, you know, so it, there's something in these tasks that are really powerful. And that's, I, once in a while you see a kid that isn't engaged and if you go talk to them, they're usually having a technical problem that they can't solve. And so once you get that technical issue, they're, they're back in it. So, you know, it's just things like they can't get their robot and iPad to connect or something like that. Like it's, it's something usually very simple so that disconnect is really not a disinterest in the task. It's just, they got too frustrated. Uh, we, we should also um, um, credit the school with, with some of that. Um, I think Krista mentioned at the start, the, the school that this particular episode had, uh, uh, where we had filmed this, this particular, particular episode, um, is a, a school for uh, uh, children, children with learning problems. Sorry, my mouth is going bad. Um, some kind, a whole lot of them uh, with mathematics learning problems. And one of the things they do year after year is hammer in the importance of persistence and patience with a, you know, don't say you can't do it, say you can't do it yet. I mean, that's just part of the culture of this school and they do it really well. Thank you. So uh, we would ask the um, attendees if you could raise your hand if you have a question and um, I will uh, enable your microphone and if you could introduce yourself. And we have Paul Abdu waiting. And Abdu, I'm going to, I think you should be able to speak now. And George, there will be one as well in the chat after. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rita. Abdu? Okay, hello. My name is Abdu Karim today from Canada. So I have two questions. The first one is, uh, on your title of this uh, presentation, and uh, okay, slide uh, show the, the first slide. So, I see there coding in the Ontario one to eight months. So, I just want to know if uh, in Ontario you start coding uh, with the student from level one primary school, and if it is the case, do they really understand coding from level one? That's the first question. Second one is. Uh, you are talking about the metaphors of uh, code, like uh, the, the first one you say, moving along a path, location. And uh, all over the presentation, I don't see negative numbers. So I just wanna know if uh, uh, you don't uh, care about the negative numbers. If we are coding, we don't uh, need negative numbers. Okay, that's my question. So um, Chantelle and George, you can answer the coding question about Ontario because we're in Alberta. So yes, yeah, so we showed, um, so we, I think Chantelle mentioned at the beginning that Ontario is uh, just, has just some, uh, announced the grade one to eight curriculum and that includes coding. Uh, so that was a separate part. Krista and Bert are working in Alberta and they have a different curriculum so, so another time we could come back and talk about the Ontario one. So if we, we let you answer the second part of that question. Okay. Thanks. Just Thanks. ask Krista to bring up slide 25. I'm, I'm, I'm on it, I'm sorry. Which one is, okay. they're not. It's the, mm, it's the one before slide 26. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which one. What uh, number is that? 
Um, my slides are numbered. One more. One more? There. This one. So, um, so different instantiations of number make available different sets of numbers. So certainly um, we would see tasks like this. And a reminder, this was the opening task in grade four. They have not addressed negative numbers. We could have, we could take it very quickly to negative numbers. It, it does come next. Moving was, backwards is negative. Yeah, like it, it happens right away. But this was a simple orienting task that turned out to be much more about integration of varied instantiations of number than about figuring out how many turns it took. Yeah. So, um, and it, it also comes into is, turns very quickly. The final column in this is in this particular chart is really critical for us for um, thinking about curriculum design on the large scale and also for task design on the small scale. All of these were addressed and addressed deeply over the course of three or four tasks. But um, in direct response to your question, I, I, I think we would rate it as silly to try and load too much in the opening task. Um, we wanted an opportunity to consolidate various interpretations and tossing in a brand new concept like negatives in the very first task is um, perhaps uh, not good design. Thank you. Um, so moving on to some of the questions in the chat, we have uh, a question from Antoine, and who says, number as count ceases to be useful or ceases, ceases to be used? Oh, yeah, I mean, this is part of the idea of an integrated concept. It is, when it is present and integrated, of course it's useful. Um, so that's actually really nice phrasing that we're probably going to steal for our next article. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, just because it's not used doesn't mean it's not useful. It more likely means it's been integrated into uh, another one. Oh, and um, it, one of the things that we did flag was where the location metaphor seemed to overtake the length metaphor, and yet the length sort of seemed to be implicitly present just because they didn't say anything that was specifically in terms of length and only talked about positions doesn't mean that length wasn't useful. I mean, it is the essential interpretation in this task. So that's, that's a, actually a great question and wonderful phrasing. So thank you, Antoine. We, we, you're not going to be cited, but um, you will, <laughs> your idea will be used. <laughs> Uh, I, I might have, I might add that Antoine is saying, yes, please do use it. <laughs> use it. And we have a question from Cecilia. Cecilia, yours is longer. Would you like to ask it yourself? Um, you're able to speak right now if you want to. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, well, I, I was wondering about the role of coding in the task. I'm, I'm doing an research myself about coding and in Sweden we've integrated coding in uh, programming, we call it, in um, mathematics. And I was thinking, are these students uh, doing a task of coding, a robot to move, uh, and sort of as a result developing number sense, or are they having a lesson in mathematics and using a robot coding tool, so to speak? So what's the, what, what's in the foreground and what's in the background here? Is the coding in the foreground and, and the mathematics comes along or is the mathematics in the foreground? Uh, are these, are, is this task constructed to be a mathematics task and they're just using coding? So that was my question. Uh, we'll probably have different answers. I would say um, we parse those two things, especially at the early in the elementary grades. We parse those things at, at our peril we must understand coding tasks to be learning arithmetic tasks and we must understand uh, ar arithmetic and mathematics tasks to um, likely to have rich potential for development within coding settings and 
coding, uh, we see coding as an advanced mathematical competency that has all of these things knitted into it. To code well, the mathematics must be understood richly. I don't disagree. I kind of see it like a chicken and the egg thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. We really don't parse them. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, we have a question from Sandra, from uh, Sandra Baker from Canada. Sandra, let me find you on the list. Give me a second. Um, there we go. So Sandra, would, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, thanks for that really interesting presentation. I was just curious about the two teachers that you talked about and if you had any insights into their different backgrounds and how that led to difference in, in approaches, i.e. the scattershot approach versus the more well thought out. So having worked closely with both teachers, they were both superstars. And um, I think, you know, just like me, I had no awareness of what was in that task. I was trying to do something, but it's in, after it came up and seeing what the students were doing, going, oh yeah, you know, and those instantiations became important. So it, it's, yeah. Uh, and then the second teacher, I just cued him into that. So I, I wouldn't say it has anything to do with the qualities of the teachers because they were, like I said, both like, you know, innovators and like fantastic. Uh, it was, we're pretty confident it had to do with the fact that the second, tition, it, second teacher was alerted to it. Um, we, you know, we, if you have some recordings of, of teachers and, and students engaging with coding tasks, listen to them for the multiple instantiations of number. They'll all be present and they'll be all over the place. But being made aware of them, it like, how long was the conversation of making um, him aware of them, Krista? It doesn't take long. <laughs> well, literally, they didn't have any time. So like in the 15 minutes of prep before a task and we're, we're pulling things out, I start talking. So, you know. It doesn't take long to dramatically improve the effectiveness of pedagogy by being aware of these ideas. That's, that's great and very, very interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Sandra. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. I'd only see your name, but I know you're there. And next we have Joyce um, Umbello from Brock University. Oops. Um, Joyce, there. I think that would work, Joyce. You should be able to speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. So um, thank you again, Krista and Brent, for your presentation. Um, Brent, I was just wanted to take you back to your presentation at Fields Institute when you presented about STEM, but you gave examples of the work that you're doing with Krista as well. Um, you did mention something about um, the need to pay attention to affordances when we talk about technology. I wonder if you can talk about that in connection to your presentation today. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of ways I could go with that answer, but I'm, I'm gonna go with the, the route of repetition. Um, in, in the computational thinking settings, the coding settings, by virtue of where they are positioned in the history and um, development of mathematics, they carry that history um, in their affordances. They afford opportunities to um, invoke and integrate multiple instantiations of number. And it's not just programming moving in a straight line. If you look really carefully at just about anything where you have to enter digits, the same possibilities present themselves. Um, um, I'll stop there because really the, uh, that is the question that we are most interested in. And um, I would say that when we combine 
the mathematics that is integrated into most coding tasks with the cognitive science of how um, sophisticated knowledge arises in metaphors and blends of metaphors, um, the affordances just spill everywhere. Not a good answer, but it's impossible to answer that one in a day. And I, yeah, and I would, you know, add Celia's comment about needing good design to capitalize yeah. on yeah, that. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. I don't see any more questions from attendees. Are there any other questions from our panelists or any comments? Or any final comments from Brent and Krista? I'm so it. grateful to talk about our work. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity. This is the first time we've really had to sit down and put it together and be coherent to one another. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for bringing the videos. Um, I mean, it's a lot like the students themselves having those tools, and now we have your tools, you know, to look at them as well. So, really helpful to see them in, in action and have you analyze them. So, I will uh, pass it back to um, Ms. Sarah or Chantal. That's, that would be me. Oh, thank, Maybe, uh, thank you, George. Uh, as I just put up the, the last slide for the, for the announcements, maybe I, if I could ask you, Krista and Brent, there were many, I think, sort of uh, recommendation or advices for teachers who are integrating coding robotics in the, uh, the math uh, lessons. Could you please S summarize one or two that you would like to give uh, to conclude uh, your presentation. So c concrete advices or recommendations for teachers who might be doing for the first time soon, or maybe who have done it for a little bit. The um, one piece of advice I would highlight, um, I would frame in terms of the expert novice literature. Teachers as adults who have lots of experience and time to integrate their understanding of number need to be aware that they will move fluently and non-consciously among different instantiations. Things that they can't see as different, their students might not hear as um, reconcilable. And again, there were a few deer in the headlights moments where the students said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, but for the teacher, it was utterly integrated. So the big advice for teachers is recognize the original complexity of these concepts. And if you can, have access to the elements um, that um, contribute to them and use them more deliberately. Again, our, our, our metaphor of scattershot approach is not necessarily the best, but again, humans are these things that um, learn by putting things together that happen in the same time. It's, it turns out to be a pedagogy that works, just, but it can be better designed. So I would say for people who are beginning, don't be scared. The robotics kind of takes on its own life. It, it, it seems like a very scary process because it's kind of complicated and complex, but um, you know, having good tasks, like this is an easy task to do. You don't need a lot of equipment in the schools. Um, I've been compiling the tasks that I've been doing and I usually have a video of the teacher or the children doing them with a bunch of robotics tasks and I've been putting them up on stemeducation.ca and um, most of my videos are available. So when I do the slides, I won't be able to put the, embed the um, video into it, but I'll have a link on Vimeo to the, to the, to the um, videos that you saw that you can see. So just don't be scared. Like, I think worrying about it, I did a lot of worrying about it before I actually got into it. And it just always, there's always a few issues, you have to expect them, but it, it works out great. The benefits far outweigh any of the challenges that you may face. Yeah, and I, I, I wanna just, um, uh, what, sort of a point of elaboration uh, prompted by what Krista just said. Um, we track in these uh, coding and um, computational reasoning settings, things like the development of spatial uh, reasoning, spatial sense, uh, the development of number concepts, the, the, how, how are things happening in arithmetic, arithmetic class. Um, it turns out 
as as we signaled before that you don't need really good design to have quite an impact on spatial sense or to have quite an impact on understanding the decimal numbers but it's that's awesome but can we make it better um thank you again uh krista and brent for this uh for this presentation nice videos as well illustrating what is happening and thank you as well for all your thoughtful uh, responses to uh, the questions uh thank you to all attendees uh for uh, coming to, for being present in this uh, seminar either those who are with us right now at this very moment live and those who might be watching this from the recording that is uh, posted on the uh, mkn uh, website uh, without attendees we don't really have a seminar so again thank you for your interest in these uh, seminars I would like, we would like to ask you if you could take uh, a minute uh, or two to uh, fill out the brief attendance survey uh, for uh, the today's presentation. This is simply for uh, funding purposes. Uh, we thank again the Mathematics Knowledge Network hosted at the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences and the Social uh, Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for the financial support for having uh, this event. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you uh, in two weeks at our next seminar that will be on July 17, um, at which uh, Dr. Michel Wilkerson and Edward Rivero from University of California, Berkeley, uh, in the United States will be presenting and will be discussing uh, computing with data as a window on the world. So again, on behalf of George, Ariel and Sarah, I uh, would like to thank you for your presence. Thank you for the speakers. Uh, and um, we'll say uh, goodbye. Au revoir tout le monde et on se dit à dans deux semaines.